namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa okay we've been examining the apanaka sutta which is sutta number 60 in the Machima Nikaya. <clears throat> And last time, well, this sutta unfolds when, just to recapitulate, when the Buddha visits a town, a Brahmin village, which is inhabited by people who are called Salas the Brahmin village of Sala. And he begins by asking the people of the village whether they have placed trust or faith in any particular religious teacher, and they say that they haven't. And then the Buddha sets out to show them, to teach them what he calls a, an incontrovertible teaching. That is a teaching by which, by means of which, they can be absolutely certain that they will be following a course that will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. And he develops this teaching by taking certain pairs of opposing philosophical views that were being propagated by spiritual teachers, philosoph- philosophers in the Ganges plain during the period when he himself was teaching. And he's going to show how, without necessarily accepting any kind of fixed dogma or rigid doctrine, just by reflection upon these pairs of opposing views, a wise person can choose the better of the two alternatives. And he begins by taking two pairs of doctrines which are called in Pali Natikavada and Atikavada. Natikavada, we explain, is the doctrine of nihilism, of moral nihilism, or it could also be interpreted as the kindred doctrine of philosophical materialism. This doctrine holds that life ends with the death of the body, that there's the body itself or the person himself, herself, is constituted merely out of material elements. Mind or consciousness is just a chance byproduct of these material processes. And so when the body dies, then consciousness is extinguished and nothing remains after death. And so for the philosophical nihilist, the wisest course of life is to just selfishly enjoy oneself to the utmost of one's capacity to indulge the desires for the pleasures, for sensual pleasures, to accumulate wealth which will help you enjoy sensual pleasures, to, if one is involved in politics in any way, to make a bid for power so that one can command wealth and gain access to means of sensual enjoyment. And then the Buddha, when he examines this view, he brings out various negative consequences, negative consequences which are visible right here and now, and then negative consequences which pertain to the afterlife if there is an afterlife. And then having examined this view, the wise person decides that it would be an unwise investment. Then the Buddha takes the contrary view, which is the doctrine of, what we call it, (laughs) affirmationism, atikavada, the doctrine which affirms that there is life beyond death and that our actions, our volitional actions, do have consequences that rebound upon us in our future lives. So if this doctrine is true, 
then it becomes a measure of prudence to avoid unwholesome behavior and to engage in wholesome deeds. And by acting in this way, if there is no life beyond death, at least the person is a respected, esteemed member of society. He's accepted by other wise people. He's regarded as a model, an exemplar for others. And he enjoys a clear conscience. And if there is a life beyond death, then this person wins in that, on that count as well, since he will reap the results, the fruits of his good actions, his good karma. Okay, so that is the basic structure of the argument. And now we come to the second pairs of contrary doctrines, of opposing doctrines. The title in Pali, or even in English, might be a little puzzling. But the Pali name for this doctrine, for the first doctrine, is called Akiryavada, which is translated literally, the doctrine of non-doing. But what this doctrine holds is not that actions themselves don't exist, but rather that there's no valid basis for making moral distinctions. And therefore, there's no basis for imputing the characteristic of evil to actions conventionally regarded as bad, and no basis for ascribing the characteristic of goodness or merit to actions traditionally or conventionally regarded as virtuous or wholesome. We come now to paragraph 13 in the sutta. This is on page 510. And you might find it a little difficult to believe that anybody <laughs> who is considered sane, rational human being could hold such a view as this. But in fact, such a view was being propagated by certain thinkers in northern India during the time of the Buddha. And in one sutra in the Diga Nikaya called the Samanya Pala Sutta, the discourse on the fruits of recluseship, this doctrine is ascribed to one of the Buddha's contemporaries named Purana Kasapa. Okay, we read the text. Okay. When one acts or makes others act, when one mutilates or makes others mutilate, when one tortures or makes others inflict torture, when one inflicts sorrows or makes others inflict sorrow, when one oppresses or makes others inflict oppression, when one intimidates or makes others inflict intimidation, when one kills living beings, takes what is not given, breaks into houses, plunders wealth, commits burglary, ambushes highways, seduces another's wife, utters falsehood. In other words, the whole list of actions here generally regarded as completely blameworthy, punishable by the law, um, immoral, evil, objectionable, censurable, reproachable, reprehensible, unacceptable. And when performs any of these actions, no evil is done by the doer. And if that's not bad enough, even if with a razor-rimmed wheel, it's a wheel with the big wheel, with the blade, with the rim as sharp as a razor blade, one were to go around the earth making all the living beings into just one mass of flesh, killing them all, executing them with this razor sharp wheel. Because of this, there would be no evil and no outcome of evil, no fruit of the evil deed. If one, if that's not bad enough, then if one were to go along the south bank of the Ganges River, 
killing and slaughtering, mutilating and making others mutilate, torturing and making others inflict torture. Because of this, there would be no evil and no outcome of evil. If one were to go along the north bank of the Ganges, giving gifts and making others give gifts, making offerings and making others make offerings, because of this there would be no merit and no outcome of merit. By giving, that's by generosity, by taming oneself, by restraint, by speaking truth, there is no merit and no outcome of merit. And so some of the thinkers would go around to, I guess, to traveling to different villages and towns, preaching a doctrine like this, and then expecting that this doctrine in some way will lead to a cohesive society in which they, since they get supported by the arms of devotees, They would expect people to make offerings to them and to support them. I don't see how that's possible. Also, I don't quite understand what would be the underlying basis for a view like this. But according to the sub-commentary, what underlies this view is the idea that the soul, that there is a permanent soul or self which is somehow intrinsically pure, So no matter what actions one performs, do not leave any blemishes on the soul. So the good actions, the bad actions, don't adhere to the soul. That's one explanation in the sub-commentary. But the sub-commentator is writing a thousand years after the time of the Buddha, so we don't know how reliable his interpretation is. It's also possible, I think, this Purana Kasapa was regarded as in some sense a fatalist or deter- strict determinist. So he could have held the view that everything a person does is absolutely determined or predestined. So if somebody, it's his destiny to go around the streets as a ma- serial killer, just killing people, or strangling people, robbing banks, becoming a seducer, going around seducing the wives of others, being a robber, a criminal. We can't blame him since that's his destiny. He's not doing anything wrong. He's just fulfilling his destiny. Another person is a philanthropist, a renunciant, a very noble, what we would think of as a noble-minded person. Again, we can praise that person or congratulate him because this person is just following his destiny, following a pattern that has been imprinted on his nature from the very outset. Okay, so that is the doctrine of not doing then opposed to this is the opposite doctrine, which is the doctrine that there is doing, that moral distinctions are real, bad actions are really evil, good actions generate merit. And so this person, this thinker says, when one mutilates, makes others mutilate, and so on, evil is done by the doer. If one goes around killing everybody, again, one creates evil and will have to face the consequences of evil. If one distributes gifts, makes offerings and so forth, that is meritorious and one will gain the fruits of meritorious deeds. Okay, so these doctrines are directly opposed to each other. Okay, and now when a simple village people like these Brahmins of Sala are confronted with these opposing views. This is what the Buddha recommends as the approach to deal with them. We, we're in paragraph 15 now. Okay. One considers that those recluses and Brahmins who proclaim 
the doctrine of non-action, of non-doing, it is to be expected that they will avoid the three wholesome states, that is, good bodily conduct, good verbal conduct, good mental conduct, and that they will undertake the three unwholesome types of behavior, bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, mental misconduct. I mean, if they're told that they can get away with murder, then they might very well decide to take up that possibility. And the reason for this, again, the argument is just like the argument against nihilism, that they do not see in unwholesome states the danger, degradation, and defilement, nor do they see in wholesome states the blessing of renunciation, that is the blessing of renouncing them and the aspect of cleansing, getting cleansed of them. Okay, now in paragraph 16, the Buddha takes up or presents his own standpoint, the standpoint which affirms, or at least implicitly, that there is doing. In other words, that moral distinctions are valid. And so one who simply holds the view that there is no doing, in other words, no validity in moral distinctions, has wrong view. If he forms intentions, formulates plans on the basis of this view, then he's engaging with in wrong intention. He has wrong motivation, wrong purpose. And when he speaks to others and tries to propagate this idea that there's no point in making moral judgments, that we can't describe some actions as good, other actions as bad, then this is wrong speech. I think when I was a <laughs> college philosophy student, I used to hold views like this, so I was guilty of wrong speech. <laughs> and then if, when he, since he is holding this view and declaring that there is no action, no real morally significant action, then he is opposed to the arahants, the wise or liberated ones, who hold the doctrine that there is action. In other words, that there is morally significant action. And then if this person tries to convince or succeeds in convincing other people to adopt this view, then he's leading those people into false, even dangerous doctrines. And then if he succeeds in convincing others and gathers a following around him, then he becomes proud of himself and starts praising himself and disparaging others. And thus, if previously he had adopted pure conduct, then that is abandoned and he's taking up impure conduct. And then he has wrong view, wrong intention, wrong speech, and so on. All of these are evil, unwholesome states that come into being with wrong view as their condition. This is really an extremely important statement. I think I overlooked it last week to place the emphasis upon it. That wrong view, according to the Buddha, is one of the most powerful forces in determining, we call the destiny of, of, of people's behavior, or determining people's behavior, and thereby in determining the destiny or course of the world. In some short suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha says that he sees no factor which is so responsible for causing suffering and misery as wrong view, and no factor is so responsible for bringing true welfare and happiness as right view. So here, wrong view plays the role of bringing all of these other unwholesome factors, wrong purposes, wrong speech, wrong action, into being. I can think of a, almost a contemporary example of this doctrine of non-doing. 
I don't know if you will remember, this was back about 1970, 71. There was a, the Sharon Tate murder case in California. She was an actress married to a famous Polish director, Polensky, is that his name? And she and I think several others were found dead in their house, in the, or she was found dead in her house, and it created a big stir in California. There seemed to be no ostensible motive for the crime. Nothing was taken away from the house. And then the investigations of the police landed upon a den of kind of hippie, like disreputable hippie types, led by one person, one man, his name was Charles Man- Manson, and he was surrounded by a little harem of his girlfriends. And I remember when he was brought into court or before for questioning, he would ask, why did you commit this crime? And he would say things like, it's all unreal, man, ain't it? So it doesn't matter. What does it matter, man? It's all just a dream anyway. <laughs> okay, so now we come to the way the wise person considers this view. Okay, so he considers that if there is no doing, that is, if there's no real... A basis for moral distinctions and no consequences of our what we judge to be morally potent acts. Then when the body breaks up at death, this person will be safe enough since he doesn't have to face the consequences of his action. Of course, if he really engages in subs- well, this is after death, okay. When death takes place, since the actions don't exert any kind of karmic influence, he doesn't have to face the consequences. But if there is doing, then on the dissolution of the body after death, he will reappear in a state of deprivation that's in the lower realms, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. And so, even whether or not the words of these recluses and Brahmins is true, let me assume that there is no doing. In other words, let's assume that his position, his view is correct. Still, this person here and now in this very life is censored, blamed by the wise as an immoral person, one who holds michaditi, a wrong view, and one who holds the doctrine of non-action. But on the other hand, if there is some validity in moral distinctions and some consequences of actions in lives beyond this present life, then this good person has made an unlucky throw on both counts, for he's blamed by the wise here and now, and then with the breakup of the body after death, He gets reborn in the lower realm, in the plane of misery, even in one of the hell realms. And so he has wrongly accepted and undertaken this incontrovertible teaching in such a way that it extends only to one side and excludes the wholesome alternative. That is, it extends only to one side in the sense that Okay, even if there is no life, no no afterlife, then he gets away for with you could say literally he gets away with murder in this life here. Um, let's say he, he is safe here and now only if there is no afterlife, but still right here and now he's blamed by the wise. But if there is an, an afterlife, then he has to face the consequences. And he takes it up in such a way that it excludes the wholesome alternative. That is, by taking up this view, then he excludes right view, and then everything that follows from right view, right intention, right speech, right action. 
Okay, so that is the examination of the view of non-doing. Then directly opposed to this, there is the view of that there is doing. In other words, that moral distinctions are real, valid, that bad actions judged by society to be bad are, at least in many cases, really evil, and actions regarded, conventionally regarded as good, do create merit. And so, when recluses and Brahmins propagate the view that when one acts, makes others act, and so on, there is merit and the outcome of merit, it is to be expected that they will avoid three unwholesome states, bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, and mental misconduct. And they will undertake and practice the three wholesome states, good bodily conduct, good verbal conduct, and good mental conduct. And why is that? Because these good recluses and Brahmins see in unwholesome states the danger, degradation, and defilement, and they see in wholesome states the blessing of renouncing them, the blessing of cleansing. Okay, then everything follows in the same order. Since they're... Now the Buddha, in paragraph 19, he's now laying down his perspective on the situation, the perspective of one who actually sees into the nature of things and who knows what is true and what what is false. And so he says, since there actually is doing, in other words, morally significant action, one who holds the view that there is doing has right view. And one who formulates or forms plans gives rise to intentions based on this right view has right intention. And one who makes the statement there is doing, that there are real actions, morally valid or moral and moral, morally, that there are morally determinate actions, such a person has right speech. And then one who holds this view is not opposing the enlightened ones who hold the doctrine that there is doing or action. And if he convinces other people to accept the view that there is action, then he is convincing others to accept a true principle, true Dhamma. And even though he convinces others to accept this Dhamma because he has correct understanding, he doesn't praise himself and disparage others. And so in this way, any kind of corrupt conduct that he had is abandoned and his virtue is purified or developed and he gains, he acquires right view, right intention, right speech and so on. So all these wholesome states come into being with right view as their condition. And we have here in this formulation in a kind of miniature some sections of the Noble Eightfold Path. And we find in the formulation of the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha begins with right view, then goes on to right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And the reason why the Buddha puts right view at the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path is precisely for the same reason. Because right view is the forerunner and the guide for all wholesome states. Okay, now we come to the way the wise person reflects on this. The wise person reflects that if there is doing, then on the dissolution of the body after death, this person will reappear in a good, will be reborn in a good state, even in one of the heavenly worlds. So whether or not the word of those philosophers is true or not, is true, let me assume that there is no doing. Let's grant them the truth of their position. Still, this person 
the one who accepts this view that there is doing is praised by the wise in this very life. They say he's a virtuous person, silavanto, they say. He is one with right view, samaditiko. He's a kiriyavadi. These are words which are still, I think, understood by people in India and regarded as qualities of a worthy person. And so the person is praised and admired by the wise in society. He's looked to and as, an, as a model, an example. His advice is sought. He's given honors and awards as an outstanding citizen. He's popular with people, regarded as respectable, admirable, trustworthy, and so on. Okay, even if there is no afterlife, even if these thinkers are wrong, the ones who say that there is that there is some continuing effect of actions after death. But on the other hand, now the argument continues, if there is doing and consequences of action after death, then this good person has made a lucky throw on both counts since he is praised by the wise here and now, and then he also wins in the afterlife, since on the dissolution of the, after, of the body, he will be reborn in a good destination, in a happy world, even in the heavenly world. Assuming that in addition to holding this view, he forms good intentions, speaks good words, and behaves in a appropriate way. So this person has rightly accepted and undertaken this incontrovertible teaching in such a way that it extends to both sides, that it extends both to the benefit in this present life and to benefits after death in the afterlife. And it excludes the unwholesome alternative with all of its undesirable consequences. Okay, so this is the examination of this pair of doctrines, non-doing and doing. And now we come to the third pair of opposing views. These are the doctrines of non-causality and causality. And this was the doctrine of non-causality. This was another strange doctrine that was being propagated at the time of the Buddha by a sect which continued to exist in India even right into the medieval period. They were called the Ajivakas. And the doctrine of the Ajivakas was a kind of almost a fatalism or a predestinationism. They held that they held a very elaborate cosmology with many ideas that would strike us as rather strange and somewhat incomprehensible. We find their cosmology in the Majjhima Nikaya in Sutta number 76 on page 622 in this volume. But I'm not going to go through it, but just if you want on your own, you can read it. But the basic idea that they held is that everything is predetermined by a force which they called niyati, which you could, we might translate as destiny or faith. And living beings transmigrate through the round of existence, through samsara, but there's a fixed course that every being has to pass through. Each being has its own course to follow, but each being has a fixed course to pass through. And that course is determined for that being by destiny or faith. And so the, every being has to be reborn in one particular mode a certain number of times, in another form a certain number of times, and still another form a certain number of times. And they go on and on like this for incalculable periods until eventually 
everyone at some point in the future automatically gains liberation no matter what they do. And so the, these thinkers would say whether they be fools or wise men they all will be liberated in the end. They use the simile of a ball of thread, a ball of string. You take the ball of string, you hold the end of the string and you throw the ball. The ball unravels till it, eventually it reaches its end. And so our destiny in samsara, it's like this ball unraveling ball of thread of string unraveling. It rolls on and on and on and just as the ball of thread has to come to its end, so our transmigration has to come to an end no matter what our behavior might be. We can't make any effort to shorten it and no matter what we do will not lengthen our bondage to samsara. Okay, so let's see the way they formulate their view. This is now we're in paragraph 21. Okay, there are some recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. There is no cause or condition for the defilement of beings. Beings are defiled without cause or condition. There is no cause or condition for the purification of beings. Beings are purified without cause or condition. And here by cause or condition, what is meant is a cause or condition that arises from within a person. That is, that it's not our own actions, our own thoughts that defile us, not our own actions, not our own thoughts, not our own effort that will purify us. There is no power, no energy, no manly strength, no manly endurance. But all beings, all living things, all creatures, all souls are without mastery, without power, without energy. They are molded by destiny, circumstance and nature. And they experience pleasure and pain in the six classes. Six classes were six classes of human beings that the Ajivakas had posited in their strange theory. And so this is an extreme type of fatalism or predestinationism. Even in Christianity, there was a counterpart of this. Actually, it's Calvinism, which holds that, I don't know if they still hold the position in this such an extreme form, that, but they used to hold that each individual from the moment of birth is predestined by God either for salvation or damnation. So no matter what the individual does, doesn't matter if that individual is slated by God to be saved, to be one of the elect, that person will be saved. If that person is slated for rejection, damnation, the person will be damned. There's nothing the person can do by changing his conduct, by prayers and petitions, but the destiny is fixed even from the beginning of time. And this view here seems to be a kind of Indian counterpart of that. Okay, then the opposite of this is the view of which recognizes the role of human causation. These thinkers say there is a cause and condition for the defilement of beings. Beings are defiled owing to a, to a cause and condition. There is a cause and condition for the purification of beings. Beings are purified owing to a cause and condition. And for the Buddha, that cause and condition lies within ourselves, in our own efforts, our own exertion, our own attempt to practice and live by Dharma. 
there is power, energy, manly strength, manly endurance. I have to apologize. This <laughs> translation was done originally by Venerable Jnana Moli in the 1950s before the days when words like manly had gone out of fashion. <laughs> so now I think we would say human strength, human endurance. <laughs> But the word that the Pali uses is purisa, which actually does mean man. It is not the case that all beings, all living things, all creatures, all souls are without mastery, power and energy or that they are molded by destiny, circumstance and nature. And so these two doctrines are opposed, directly opposed to one another. Okay, then the Buddha will examine them exactly in the same, according to the same pattern that he examined the previous two pairs of opposing doctrines. You can read it on your own. I won't go through and just, I'll just be repeating what I've just, pretty much what I just said. But just, you just, when you read it through, you just have to take note of the little variations. Okay, so now I skip over this whole examination. We just come to the conclusion where the Buddha takes the wise man who after weighing these two views comes to the conclusion that to undertake the incontrovertible teaching he will take up the view that there is causation, there is causality. In fact, that is the view which is most meaningful in human life since if one wishes to be happy, to be secure, one has to consider what should I do to gain that happiness, to gain that well-being, to gain that peace. If one just takes the view, oh, everything is fixed, even if one doesn't take a fatalist view, but we could take a kind of biological determinism. Everything is inscribed on the genes So whatever happens to us, it's just a working out of our genetic code or else maybe a kind of psychological determinism. Our whole character, our my personality, it was formed in the first three or five years of my life. We went through, it was this, the Oedipus complex. What were the other complexes? We had to go through all of this. I know it was the oral phase, anal phase, genital phase, Oedipus complex. At that point, the whole blueprint of the mind is fixed and everything that I'm doing now is just submitting to that original ground plan that was established in the first few years of my life. Or else we take social determinism, everything is governed by the economic order, politics, social relations, culture, everything is determined by the forces of production. And so there's no use doing anything since we just have to submit to the decrees of economics. Okay, so those are modern counterparts of this determinism. But considering weighing the two positions, one sees that to really find happiness for oneself, one has to take action and make an effort. And so even in pragmatic terms, one will be acting, even if one accepts the doctrine of non-causality, but still one will be weighing the benefits of investing in this stock or that stock. (laughs) Um, going for vacation in this place or that place. And so one will be acting almost necessarily as though there were causation. The one should take a good luck charm along with you when you go for vacation. Okay, now we come to section four of the sutta. This is paragraph 29. And now the Buddha is considering two opposing views which are not so drastic as the three that we've considered. This is the question of whether there exist or do not exist immaterial realms 
what we call these formless realms, realms of existence, realms of being, realms inhabited by living beings in which there is no material phenomena, in which there are no material phenomena, no physical bodies. And to make this intelligible, this debate intelligible, I just give a short um, survey of the Buddhist cosmos, the Buddhist universe. We divide the universe into three levels. Okay, these are called in Buddhist terminology the three realms of existence, or the triple world. The lowest realm is the sensual realm. These are the planes of existence in which sensual desire is the strongly powerful motivating force of being. And in which we experience, in which beings experience a wide variety of sense objects. And the form, I'm sorry, the sensual realm includes Amongst others, it includes the human realm and the animal realm. Then below the human and animal realm, there is the hell realms. And above the human realm, there are a number of heavenly worlds, heavenly realms, in which there is a preponderance of very refined and exquisite sensual pleasures. And those who perform bad, evil, unwholesome actions, they take rebirth in the lower realms of, or in the lower planes of the sensual realm. And those who create wholesome karma, virtuous karma, of a rather mundane kind, will be reborn either in the human realm or in the lower heavenly realms, in the heavenly realms. But there are some yogis, meditators, who are able to master the the mind to such an extent, excuse me, that they can enter into very deep stages or states of meditative absorption. We call these stages the jhanas, or in Sanskrit, the dhyanas. These are states in which the mind is able to rest undistractedly, unwaveringly upon a single object and then become completely immersed in that object experiencing bliss and joy, equanimity, peace, tranquility. In these stages, the waves of the mind settle down and the mind becomes still, like a lake in which the wind is stopped blowing. And so the waves and ripplets of wavelets all subside, the lake becomes still and quiet. And those who master these stages without going further, when they pass away, they will not be reborn in the sensual realm. To get into these stages of absorption, one has to give up the attraction to sensual pleasures. And so there's no longer any active sensual desire, but there's a subtle attachment to this bliss and tranquility of the meditative state. And that subtle attachment to the bliss and peace of the meditative state will lead these yogis, meditators, to rebirth into spheres of existence, planes of existence that are the objective counterpart of those states. 
this is, they're not just imaginary realms or mind-created realms. Well, in a sense, everything is, <laughs> all realms are created by mind, in a sense. But they're not just mental fabrications. Well, in a sense, all realms are <laughs> mental fabrications. But they're not just mental imaginings. But they are, just as we say that this world is a real world, these worlds are also quite real for the beings who are living there. <laughs> And when they are reborn in those realms, they remain there for what is to us unimaginable periods of time. At least one cosmic epoch, you know, one big bang, 17 billion years, something like that. But that's the minimum. It goes on and on up to hundreds and hundreds of great kalpas, great aeons. And in that realm... We call this the Rupa Datu, the realm of subtle form or, or subtle matter. So we don't have the gross, t- tangible matter that we have here. But there is very highly refined material phenomena. So the beings there can see and hear. According to the commentaries, there's no smelling, tasting, or touching because those involve the grosser senses. There is seeing and hearing, but most of the time the beings there are not even interested in what they can see and hear, but they spend most of their time absorbed in these deep meditative concentrations. But because they still have subtle attachment and ignorance, they're not free from samsara, from the round of rebirth. Okay, now some yogis go even further in their development of samadhi, of concentration. And they pursue the concentration to a level where the meditative object changes so that they become absorbed in an object which doesn't have any kind of concrete form at all. And these the meditative states that are attained are called the formless meditative absorptions. In Pali, we call these arupa samapati. In the first of these, the object of focus is the infinity of space. In the second, the object shifts from the infinity of space to the infinity of the mind, which is aware of infinite space. So it's called the sphere of infinite consciousness. Then beyond that lies an attainment called the sphere of nothingness or of nothing concrete, no concrete entityness. And then beyond that is the highest formless attainment called the base of neither perception nor non-perception, where perception, consciousness becomes so fine, so subtle, one can't even determine whether they exist or not. But even in these states, okay, okay, when a meditator masters one of these formless attainments, then he doesn't even have any craving for the subtle and refined experiences of the form realm. But there's still a subtle craving or attachment for the utter peace and tranquility and equanimity of these formless attainments. And so at death, this subtle attachment will lead the stream of consciousness to rebirth in the realms that are the objective counterparts 
of the formless attainments. And in those realms, when the being is reborn in one of those realms, the material body falls away. In other words, consciousness in those realms is not based on a physical body. But the consciousness continues there, utterly detached from any physical or material base. What it's like to have a consciousness purely contained within itself, not based on a physical body, not sensing any sense objects, since there's no form, no matter in those realms. So one isn't perceiving anything, not aware of anything, not aware of any outward sensory object. It's something very difficult to imagine, (laughs) but (laughs) there are people who say that these states do exist. And the lifespan there is again, of tremendous duration. It begins 20,000 cosmic aeons, like 20,000 big bangs and big crunches. Then the next one is 40,000. The one above that, 60,000. The one above that, the fourth one, 80,000 cosmic epics. (laughs) Then when it's over, then you have to come back to (laughs) <laughs> maybe back to a human body and then back to working a nine to five shift <laughs> having to worry about feeding the wife and kids <laughs> sweeping the shoveling the snow in the winter paying the mortgage on one's home or getting insurance on one's car <laughs> so it's not the answer to the problem of existence, according to the Buddha. Okay, so now we have a debate going on, coming back to the Sutta. Um, Okay, so that there are some ascetics and Brahmins who hold the view there are definitely no immaterial material realms. The word here, the key word is definitely, I think it's ekang zena. I know it, there are no realms, no such realms. Those who hold us, like this Bhikkhu Bodhi, he's just spouting nonsense now. <laughs> when he's speaking as though there are such realms. I mean, what's real? Matter is real, right? All mind consciousness just surface play on basis of solid matter. And then there are some other ascetics and Brahmins who are directly opposed to them. And they're probably not meditators, but they have this belief. And so they say, there definitely are immaterial realms. How do we know? It says in our book, our scriptures, or the guru told us, or his guru told him. So they fight with each other, argue with each other. And so this is the wise man reflects. Now he's taking the cautious position, the non-committal position. Okay, some of these good ascetic recluses and Brahmins hold the view there are no immaterial realms. But I haven't seen that for myself. I haven't been able to validate this for myself. And these other teachers are going about saying that there definitely are immaterial realms. But this I haven't known for myself. In other words, he hasn't known it because he hasn't achieved these absorptions. So if, without knowing and seeing, I were to take one side and to say, only this is true, anything else is false, anything else is wrong. In other words, if I were to become dogmatic about this, 
that would not be fitting for me. We want to avoid dogmatism and one-sided views here. But now he's going to consider the consequences or the implications. Now, as to take, a, take the view, there definitely are no immaterial realms. If that view is true, then it is possible that if I undertake the right practices, then after death I might reborn, be reborn among the gods of the fine material realms, the realms of subtle matter or form, subtle form, who consist of mind. But as to the, that is, the beings in this realm, it seems mental experience is their predominant, the predom- or mentality is the pro- most prominent feature of their experience. And the form there, it's very fine and subtle. So for this reason, they're said to consist of mind. But they do have material bodies, but the bodies are very, very subtle. Okay. So it's still possible that if I undertake the necessary meditation practices, I might be reborn among the the gods of the fine material realms. But since there are no formless realms or immaterial realms, I can never be reborn there. But as to the recluses and Brahmins who hold the doctrine and view that there definitely are these immaterial realms, If their word is true, then if I undertake the appropriate practices, it's certainly possible that after death I might be reborn among the gods of the immaterial realms who consist purely of perception. There's just perception there, of course, enveloped in consciousness, but no physical bodies, no, not even the subtle physical body. And now he considers that (laughs) the taking up of rods and weapons, quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice, and false speech are seen to occur based on material form. But if there is no material form, then no weapons, no quarrels, (laughs) no false speech, no blame, no malice, all of this gone. And so none of this exists in the form, in the immaterial realms. And so reflecting in this way, he practices the way to disenchantment with material forms, to the fading away and cessation of material forms. In other words, he practices the meditations that will bring the formless attainments and if he masters at least one of them then he will be assured of rebirth after death in one or another of the formless realms. Okay, so that will be like the considerations leading to the rebirth in the formless realms. I don't know if I can be allowed to finish the next major section. It's five after eight. Okay. I heard even Shifu today continued about ten minutes after the hour in his morning lecture. (laughs) Okay, so now the next section deals with the debate on whether there is such a thing as Nibbana or not. And here the word, the expression used is in Pali, Bhavanam Nirodo. When it said cessation of being, it's a little, I have to say, enigmatic or incomprehensible, maybe a little misleading. Since what is meant is, we have to consider the meaning of the word bhava, which is translated as being. But bhava means a concrete, individual state of existence. It's a state of existence beginning with birth or conception, evolving through the stage of growth and ending in death. In other words, bhavas are the units 
that make up the chain of samsara, the chain of rebirth. And so the issue being debated here is whether there is a possibility of reaching liberation from the chain of rebirths, the possibility of deliverance from samsara. And so there are two views about this which are disputed by the ascetics. So there are some ascetic recluses and Brahmins who hold the view and doctrine there is definitely no cessation of existence or being. Probably these will maintain that samsara goes on for everybody interminably that there's no end in view, no possibility of release from the round, but all beings are just bound to birth, to the cycle of birth and death forever. And then opposed to them, there are some Maset recluses and Brahmins who say there definitely is cessation of being, there definitely is a state of liberation, a state of release state of complete freedom from birth, old age, sickness, and death. Okay, so the doctrines of these two groups are directly opposed to each other. And now the wise man considers thus. Some of these good ascetics, the recluses and Brahmins, hold the view there definitely is no cessation of being. But that has not been seen by me. I haven't seen this for myself. And then there are some others who say there definitely is cessation of being, that there definitely is some state of deliverance or liberation. But I won't immediately confirm this because I haven't known this for myself. If without knowing and seeing I were to take any one of these sides and say, this is true, the other position is wrong, then that wouldn't be fitting. I just become a dog dogmatist. I become involved in arguments with others. Maybe I join a particular group of those who say yes, and then we stage debates with others who say no, there isn't. Maybe I become a very skillful debater. I get a lot of honors and prestige but I'm not really finding the truth for myself. But let's consider the two alternatives. What are their implications? If there really is no cessation of being, if there's no end to the cycle of existence, then I might still be reborn anywhere within the three realms of existence. I could even be reborn in the immaterial realms amongst the gods who consist purely of perception. Then I remain there for billions and billions of years, thousands of kalpas, great aeons. Then eventually I will pass away from there and be reborn elsewhere. But If the view of the opposing group, those who say there definitely is cessation of being, there definitely is final liberation, complete deliverance from the cycle of becoming. If that is the case, then here and now in this very life, I might attain final nibbana. I might attain that final deliverance, nirvana, right here and now. And now he considers the view of those teachers who hold that there is no cessation of being. That doctrine is on the side of lust. Not sensual lust, but the subtle attachment to existence. That is, that view is conditioned by some desire to go on within the realm of, within the round of rebirth. 
is on the side of bondage, that view will keep one bound to the cycle of rebirths. It is on the side or it is close to delighting. It's symptomatic of taking delight in the diversified, varied experiences of the round of of different states of existence in samsara. It's connected or akin to, it involves some subtle holding or grasping, some clinging. But the view of those ascetics, the teachers who hold that there definitely is cessation of becoming, of being, that there definitely is liberation from the round of rebirths. This view is on the side of dispassion, the ending of lust, the ending of bondage, the ending of this gross delight, the ending of holding and clinging. And so, reflecting in this way, then he takes up the practice that leads to disenchantment with being, with conditioned existence, to the fading away and cessation of conditioned existence. In other words, the way that leads to Nibbana. Okay, then having presented this argument in the next part of the sutta, the Buddha gives an account of the practice that leads to liberation. The practice undertaken by the disciple who will go on to become a liberated one, an arahant. I'm not going to go into that now because what appears in the sutta here is just an abridgment, an abbreviation of an earlier sutta. And when we come to my way of arranging the sequence of suttas, we'll eventually come to the full uh, original sutta. And then we consider this text in that context. So when the Buddha finishes the sutta, then the Brahmins of Sala are delighted and they say, Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent Master Gotama, you have made the Dhamma, we're on page 519, you have made the Dhamma clear to us in many ways, like a man, as though you were holding up, I'm sorry, as though. Let's put it in the third person. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who is lost, or holding up a lamp in the darkness for those with eyesight to see forms. We go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From today, let Master Gotama accept us as lay followers who have gone to him for refuge for life. (laughs) Okay, if there is any questions, please feel free, welcome to ask. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Buddha, he draws metaphors just from things that are familiar to people, from aspects of everyday life. And what is considered here is a situation where one is contemplating what is the right course to take. So in a sense, the way one chooses that course, it's a chance one is taking, one is making a gamble whether to take this way of action or take that way of action. So if one follows the views of those who say of the nihilists or the no-actionists or the non-causalists, then one is making a, taking a bad chance or one has made a bad choice, one has gambled or made a wrong throw of the dice, so to speak. And also in dice, I think this was the Indian die, 
one side had a dark was a dark side, the other side was a bright side. And so Kali, the dark side, and Sukha, the bright side. So if one makes the bad choice, that's the dark side. Like the dark throw of throwing the, the dark face of the die. If one takes makes the right choice, that's making the bright choice. But like throwing the dice of the falls with the bright bright face bright face shown. Any further questions? There are some new people here. Um, anyway, we continue then next week. Next week we take Sutta number 47, I think. Yeah, Sutta number 47. This is in this Sutta, the Buddha now invites his disciples to investigate him, himself. So all of these suttas that we're taking in this particular group in the syllabus are concerned with how to approach the Dhamma in order to be assured that one is making the right choice, making a wise choice. And one step in this process, after considering all of these conflicting external views, is to examine the teacher, in this case, the Buddha. And so we will take that sutta. Please, if you have the book, then read it before the class. And if you come across any questions while you're reading, also make a note of them. Okay. So we just share the merits. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anamoditva chirangra kantu sasanang akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anamoditva chirangra kantu desanang akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anamoditva chirangra kantu mang parang Mang Parang, O Mang Parang, O Mang Parang, O Mang.